Northern California and San Francisco in particular are known as centers of human rights and hopefully justice and equality for all. And one of the people working to make it that way is our next guest, Michael Pappas, a member of the Human Rights Commission. Welcome. One of the newest members of the One of the rights. newest members, Absolutely. that's right. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much, David. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the path that brought you to the Human Rights Commission. How, d how did you get to be sitting here in, in front of us today? I know it, but talk to us for our viewers. Well, in fact, um, I come here wearing a couple of hats mm -hmm. today. I, I'm the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, and a lot of our work um, has been closely intertwined with the work of the Human Rights Commission. I um, first came into contact with uh, the Human Rights Commission through Teresa Sparks, who uh, I admire and respect, and um, was asked to uh, assist in some hate crimes work that they were doing. And, um, and so with that, um, I, I came to understand and know a little bit more about the work of the Commission and, and really value it and, and, mm -hmm. and think that that's an important one. D did you ever think when you were an Orthodox priest that you would be asked by a transgender <laughs> former <laughs> Marine head of the Human Rights Commission to help you on some hate crimes legislation? I mean, that must like not have been in your mind. You should have seen her introduce herself when she came to talk to the Interfaith Council. Uh -huh. She said, only in San Francisco would I be invited to such a forum? And I think that that's <coughs> what's, what's really great about our city. It really is. And, you know, in that time, uh, in the time span since, I've actually transitioned to the Episcopalian faith and, mm -hmm. and to Grace Cathedral in particular, which is very welcoming and, um, and inclusive and, and really works uh, to, uh, to build those bridges. What is it about the Episcopal faith that seems to I mean, you know, I, I have many Episcopal friends, and I, you know, it, it's kind of like if you want to meet uh, former Catholics, Buddhists, uh, you, you name it, they, they mm -hmm. seem to be at coffee hour after an Episcopal service. <laughs> what is it? We, I, I think that when, um, when people are going through crises in their lives, it seems to be the safe place to go. And, uh, and I think that, in fact, that it's a welcoming place. And, um, and in terms of people of, of faith, it's, uh, it's a place that, uh, that really walks the walk. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but why do you think that is? I mean, talk to me a little bit about the, the, the philosophy and the theology of the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Communion, that you know, speaks to so many people from former faith traditions. Well, I can sum it up in a word, because I know our time is brief here, but I remember sitting in a dogmatics class and uh, my professor saying, all theology is pastoral. Mm -hmm. And so the pastoral aspect of the Episcopal faith, looking at every person as a child of God, mm -hmm. um, is I, I think it, it really sort of attracted me. And uh, and on my journey, it was it was mm -hmm. a real important transition point. You don't think that the Greek Orthodox Church looks at everybody as a child of God? Oh, I, I believe it does. Of course, it does. Um, it's just that we you know we we evolve in life, and um, and this is I was taken. Uh, to yeah, the yeah. Episcopal faith at this point in my journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talk to me, though, about w when you were young. What attracted you to the priesthood, specifically the Greek Orthodox priesthood? Well, my, you know, my journey is an interesting one because I, I had been very, very involved in politics because my family was, and then investment banking. Mm -hmm. So my transition was a pretty radical one mm -hmm. uh, uh, back in, in the 80s. And, um, in fact, um, my transition happened as a result of... Uh, of, of uh, being accosted by a homeless person. Mm -hmm. And um, the homeless person said, uh, I mean, the, the policeman who assisted me afterwards said, uh, this fellow uh, lives down here and was told by the president at that time that if he took his meds, he'd be okay. And it really got me thinking. And, um, and, and I, where was this? This was in uh, New Jersey and New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's where I'm from. And quite honestly, I really wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to serving and helping people. So was this your Paul on the road to Damascus moment? Indeed, absolutely. People were saying he went from Saul to Paul. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, were you? Real, did you think of yourself as a Saul? I mean, were you a hard-nosed political family capitalist yeah. pig? I mean, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't <laughs> say that. No, I mean, I, I grew up in a in a very very nurturing, loving home, and and my parents, you know, reared us in the faith. Um, but um, but there, there comes a point when you really have to put uh, faith into practice, and, mm -hmm. and I think that that was probably that moment of conversion, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did your family think of that? 
Um, <laughs> they were. I they mean, I would imagine there are easier faiths to leave behind than the Greek Orthodox Church, because mm -hmm. I mean, as someone who has spent a good deal of time in Greece, was just there recently this summer. Mm -hmm. um, it's more than a religion. It is. It, it's a faith. It's the and national it's a, identity. Absolutely. It's a faith and it's a culture. I think um, in my own journey, what I've really come to realize is that we are all so interconnected. And um, so um, it's not essentially leaving one faith, but it's, it's actually kind of embracing greater faiths. And, and I think that, that the Episcopalian faith has allowed me to do that mm -hmm. in, a very, in a very pretty significant way. So who, who helped you through that? Who was your, uh, uh, your pigeon, as they say? Oh, I, I, I credit um, Mark Stanger over at Grace Cathedral, who's a very, very dear friend, uh, sort of walking me through that. But interestingly, I was received by uh, Bishop Otis Charles, who was a mutual friend of ours. First openly gay bishop in any Christian church. Yeah, and, um, and, he was, and he, he's been sort of a mentor. He's been a, he's been a great friend, and I, I, I credit him with, with uh, a lot of my own evolution. If you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. When did you meet him? Um, actually, I met him the day that I was received, and then since then we became very dear friends. I would say. Right. Yeah. You talk, uh, you, and you're speaking about it now. And we've had guests from the Episcopal Church. We've mm -hmm. had rabbis on. We've had many faith traditions on the show because I think it's a, mm -hmm. a part, frankly, of LGBT life that's often kind of tossed aside. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about the military. We don't want to talk about faith communities. But we're everywhere. Um, you know, they said. I remember reading once that supposedly 60% of the Roman Catholic clergy was gay. Do you think that's true of the Greek Orthodox clergy? I wouldn't venture to guess. Mm -hmm. I, w I wouldn't venture to guess. But, you know, we are who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we ought to be able to express that in mm -hmm. the best way that we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you don't, you've never found it to be a particularly homophobic religion? I wouldn't say that. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not in a position to judge. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, and, and and I just, I think that my own evolution has enabled me to, to really, um, to, be an, to lead an authentic life. And, and that, mm -hmm. that's, at this point in my life, that's the most important thing. How does one do that within a faith community, lead an authentic life? I mean, there's some people that just, in the LGBT community, would reject outright any sort of connection to religion, saying that's been the problem for 2,000 years or however long. Do, do you know what I think the... I, it's interesting you bring that up, and because of my role as the executive director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, you know, we, we represent 800 congregations in the city and county of San Francisco, and I think that um, people who are hurt, uh, and in particular hurt by religion, um, are, will have that attitude that you, just, that you just noted, but if I've got the pulse right, um, <coughs> the, the clergy that I have, that I know in this city, um, I, I don't think I know too many that, that are not compassionate, either mm -hmm. if they're LGBT or not, mm -hmm. towards, uh, towards LGBT members of our community. And so um, I think you would be, uh, there are so many welcoming congregations in this, in this city, and, and I think that it's, it's encouraging. Uh, and it, you just have to look a little further. Have you ever come up across one that wasn't? I mean, for instance, look at the Anglican Communion mm -hmm. now. They're going through issues with the Nigerian mm -hmm. church, and they're like, well, you know, you guys just, you know, mm -hmm. Too many women, too many homosexuals, we're going to go form our own religion. Yeah. Have you come up against that even here in the uber-liberal Northern California? Well, the good thing is that um, I can be parochial here in San Francisco, <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it a little easier. I, I would say in San Francisco, uh, few to, I mean, uh, they just don't come to the table. Um, and I think it would be very difficult to, to say that, you know, you're from a religion, in whatever that religion is, that, that, that presents God as a, a loving mm -hmm. God and to be anything to the contrary. I, I think that that would be disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Now, the Interfaith Council had a, a leadership role in the recent uh, commemorations, uh, memorials mm -hmm. of the September 11th attacks. Talk to me a little bit about what that was like. I know you were deeply involved in it and that it was uh, mm -hmm. very emotional. I know from uh, people who were here, I was not in, in the country this year for it, but um, it, it clearly was a moment. Tell me. Talk to me about it. It was, and just listening to you describe it uh, gives me pause to um, uh, to reflect upon that moment because there was a lot of planning that was involved with it. Um, we had actually been approached early on by the mayor's office, because meaning the Interfaith Council, the Interfaith Council, mm -hmm. forgive me, uh, because uh, back in 2001, it was the Interfaith Council that brought 
the, the community together, the religious community and the greater community um, at Mayor Willie Brown's invitation. And so it seemed to be the right thing to do and, uh, and both uh, Mayor Newsom and, and Mayor Lee had, had called upon us uh, to take up that leadership role. Interestingly, it happened to be the same weekend as Opera in the Park. And so our friends at the Opera, who had been uh, anticipating this because, you know, they, they uh, premiered a, a specially commissioned opera. Yes. Uh, and uh, they, they said, can we collaborate? And we didn't know what this was going to look like, um, but it really turned out to be something spectacular uh, and something fitting. There were about 15,000 people in the park, and uh, we attracted uh, faith leaders from throughout the Bay, Bay Area, not just <coughs> San Francisco. And what was interesting, a couple of highlights where we had a Muslim woman uh, uh, basically offer the invocation flanked by all faith leaders. Mm -hmm. And, and it sent a very, very powerful message uh, to the greater, greater community. Uh, in addition, um, Mozart's Requiem was played, and, uh, and it was designed essentially as a mass, but what we did was at those interludes uh, between the movements, uh, there were prayers offered from all different kinds of faiths, from the Baha'is to the uh, indigenous, indigenous Native Americans, uh, Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Jews. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really just a very, very powerful moment. I think it was a powerful moment for the city because uh, strangely in New York, which was where it happened, um, um, there was no presence of the religious community there. You know, I remember Bishop Bill Swing of the uh, Diocese of California, Episcopal mm -hmm. Diocese of California, once said in a sermon that 95% of all wars of all time are fought in the name of God. Mm -hmm. um, are you optimistic about what the Interfaith Council can do to maybe counter that some way? And, and we are. We, we, we were born 22 years ago out of two crises, uh, a homeless crisis here in San Francisco spun out of control and the Loma Prieta earthquake. And um, in both cases, uh, religious leaders were called into the mayor's office and uh, and, and gathered to help give relief uh, to the earthquake. And quite honestly, um, if there was not an interfaith council, there would need to be one created just because religion has a moral responsibility to respond. What we have found as the most effective way to do interfaith is through service. Through service. We've been speaking with Michael Pappas of Service here in San Francisco on the Human Rights Commission. I'm David Perry. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll tune in next week for 10%.